Father, we want to thank you once again, Lord, for this beautiful day that you blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you have given us to just come, sit at your feet, and to learn from your word. Thank you for the wonderful Holy Spirit that ministers to us, God. And even as we learn together, pray, God, that you will speak into our hearts, that every seed that is sown in our hearts will be fruit in our lives. God, we thank you. We come at these two hours just studying and learning into your hands of God. Give us the wisdom, give us the grace to understand what your word says and then to apply it in our lives. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Okay, so we've been covering on uh, uh, in the last class we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit. Excuse, excuse me, Pastor. There is too much echo from the background. We can't hear really? clearly. There is too much echo. Too much, too echo. much echo. Yeah, from the background. Is it better now? No, there is still an echo coming. Not yet. Is there gain? Is there gain? Where is the gain? Is the ox on? Ox is on. Then use the ox. Is that better now? Okay. All right, I guess it's a little better now. So Okay, so where we stopped last class was uh, we've, we've been looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, right? And we look Pastor, at prophets. Pastor, Pastor it, it, it's no better. It's it's no. You can't hear clearly. You can't maybe hear there it. is, maybe there is a a speaker that is open within the room. There's quite a bit of echo. Hold on. Uh, I think we we, we just uh, good enough. We just sent it to, uh, like what it was before, so we haven't made any changes. Can you check your settings, please? Is everyone else having the same problem? It's same. It's same for us also, Pastor. Okay. How about now? Is it better now? I think it's better. Yeah, very clear. Yes. Okay. Now yes, it is good. Better. Okay. It is good now. Thank okay. You. So we'll get into, uh, we've been talking about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We looked at how from Genesis, God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, God used many men and women of God to do the ministry, to, to fulfill his purpose and his plans in in, in the life of people there. So we looked at, on um, in the book of Genesis, we looked at Exodus, Numbers, and in, in, in Judges, how God used people to uh, fulfill every purpose that he had. Uh, then we also looked at Saul, King Saul. Uh, work in his life. Again, the, the, the leadership of King Saul getting to King David and then again, David leading by the Holy Spirit. So now we'll get into the, the Holy Spirit in First and Second Kings. Now, when you read First and Second Kings, there's there's a lot happening there, right? In First and Second Kings, we mostly look at the life of uh, Elijah and Elisha, 
right? And how God used these prophets so powerfully by the work of the Holy Spirit, right? So let's read and look at a few examples of how uh, God worked in the life of Elijah and Elisha. First Kings chapter 18 and verse 12. Can someone read that, please? First Kings chapter 18 and verse 12. And as soon as I leave you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I come to tell Hahab, and he does not find you, he will kill me. Et your servant has feared the Lord from my youth. Yes. So now, First Kings chapter 16 onwards is very interesting because in verse 17, Elijah, you know, God tells Elijah, go into the mountains and be there because I'm going to send the ravens to come and feed you. Right. And so the ravens come and feed Elijah. And then the widow at Zarephath, where God uses Elijah to do a wonderful miracle there. Uh, and then in verse 18, Elijah is saying, Listen, I don't know where I'm going to be next because right now I'm here with you, right? And the next moment, I don't know where the Holy Spirit will take me. So there's no way of me telling you this is what I'm going to do or this is how I'm going to do my next work of ministry. So Elijah is pointing to the fact that everything that he's been doing is by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Think of this. Elijah tells, we talked about this last class. Elijah goes to the king and he says, Ahab, it's not going to rain. And it happens so by the word of Elijah. How? Because he was led by the Holy Spirit. Later on, he goes, uh, um, you know, three years later, he says, Okay, Ahab, go and tell the king, Ahab, that it's going to rain. Again, led by the Holy Spirit, right? And imagine this, you've got 300 prophets of Baal, you've got about 400 prophets of Asarad, about 700 people, Elijah is standing there, he's at Mount Carmel, and this is one person going against 800 people. Now, can we do this on our own strength? You've got one man, Elijah, standing against about 800 people. And Elijah is saying, let's have a challenge. Whichever God that answers by fire, that is the real God. Have you, have you read that portion? Right? You see that you know, they went up to the uh, in, in the same chapter, chapter 18. Uh, you go on and read it. And you know, Elijah is standing and he's, he's also making fun of the other prophets and his uh, other prophets of the other gods, and he's saying, Maybe your God is sleeping, or maybe he's resting. Why don't you go and you know wake him up? Now we see that Elijah was able to do all of this because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon his life. Right? Elijah was led by the Holy Spirit all through in his ministry. And then that ministry of the Holy Spirit went on to his successor, Elisha. We see that Elisha, you know, here's something very interesting. Elisha says, Elisha knows that at any time, Elijah is going to go. And Elijah says, okay, tell me what do you want? What do you want for your ministry? You're going to take up this mantle next. You're going to be the next prophet in Israel. So what is it that you want? Elisha says, I want a double portion of your anointing. I want a double portion of your anointing. Elijah says, that's very hard, but if you see me taken up into the clouds and going up to heaven, if you see it with my own eyes, with your own eyes, then you will receive what you have asked for. Interestingly, Elijah worked about seven miracles. Elisha did 14 miracles. Elisha, again, in his ministry, was led by the Holy Spirit in every area of his ministry. Think of this. 
Now, I always read this passage and I'm fascinated by this passage. Naman has leprosy. He's the king of the Assyrian army. Now, he's a man who is well known, famous, powerful. And there's a little servant girl, right, who goes and tells the king, the, the leader of the commander, Naman, says, I know a prophet here. His name is Elisha. The spirit of the Lord is upon him. Right? And I know that if you go to him, he can heal you of your leprosy. Now think of this. Did Nama, did Elisha do any miracles be before this? No. Did he heal a leper before this? No. But here's what the sentence that the little girl says. She says, the spirit of the Lord is upon him and he will be able to bring healing to you. Now think of this. Elisha, this commander, Right, he goes to Naman. Sorry, he goes to uh, to Elisha. He's gone to his house. What does Elisha say? Tell him to go and duck seven times. He has to dip himself in the pond in in Jordan, the River Jordan, that muddy pond. Go and dip seven times. Now, why did Elisha say this? Because he was led by the Holy Spirit of God. Right, the Holy Spirit. Told him to say it. So, Naman, if you want to get healed, you got to let go of all your ego, all your pride, everything that you feel you're, you're great in doing. You got to let go of it. Now, think of this. Naman is going. He's a commander. He's got hundreds of people with him. Right? He goes to the River Jordan. He takes off his you know his clothes or his his helmet and all those you know the 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 clothes that the army wears all his weaponry he's taking it all off and he's going into the pool and there are hundreds of people watching him if i don't get healed elisha's dead i'm going to go back and kill him and i'm made of, i'm making a fool of myself listening to this guy what if these people go back and tell the king how, you know, Naman had leprosy. He, some prophet told him, you know, uh, dip seven times. He dipped seven times. Nothing happened. You'll be a laughing stock in the entire nation of his Assyria there. But he obeyed it. Why? The little girl said, the spirit of the Lord is upon him. We see that ministry in Elisha's life. Elisha comes back and says, I'm taking some of the sand in this land because I believe that your God is the one and only true God. Amen? That's so powerful. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, even those who are unbelievers will believe the work of God in our life. That's what happened in the Old Testament. Look at the life of David. Let's look at a few scriptures. People connected by the Spirit. First Chronicles chapter 12, 17 and 18. First Chronicles chapter 12, 17 and 18. It's right after Second Kings. First Chronicles chapter 12, 17 and 18. David went out to meet them and said to them, If you have come to me in peace to help me, I am ready for you to join me. But if you have come to betray me to my enemies, when my hands are free from violence, may the God of our ancestors see it and judge you. Yeah. Then this yes. Then we see another example in First Chronicles 28 12, where God gives through the Holy Spirit, God gives David the wisdom to design the temple. See that first chronicles chapter 28 and verse 12. And the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord and for all the surrounding rooms 
for the storehouse of the house of God and for the storehouses of the dedicated things. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll just read it once again. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for all the codes of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries for the dedicated things. David was given the wisdom by the Holy Spirit to design this, right? And he did it that way. Then we look at the life of Nehemiah, right? Again, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. Let's go into Nehemiah. Now, let me just give you a quick background of what's happening in the book of Nehemiah. How many of you have read the book of Nehemiah? Sorry, read that again. Read it in the mic. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave their water for their, for their thirst, thirst. Yeah. He also gave his good spirit to them. Now, let me give you a little bit of a background of what's happening in Nehemiah. How many of you know we have read the book of Nehemiah? Okay. Begin to read this book. This is a very good book when it comes to leadership. We lead, we'll learn a lot of principles on leadership, right? How many of you want to be leaders? Okay. So you got to read this book, right? Now, Nehemiah, let me give you a background. Okay. Nehemiah is, is in. Is a, is a, he was a cup bearer, right? He, his main responsibility is to take this cup of drink, go to the king, and give it. Now, this is the Babylonians. The Babylonians have come. They have destroyed Jerusalem. And after destroying Jerusalem, they took a few of them captive. And among them, I think it was during the second reign, is when Nehemiah has gone there. Now, Nehemiah is a cup bearer. He, his work was comfortable. He's not, you know, doing hard labor outside. Comfortable job. What's his job? He has to hold, take a cup. When the king says, I'm thirsty, he has to go. He has to taste, taste it, make sure everything's all right, give it to the king. Very simple job. Right? Now, the Bible says that when Nehemiah was doing that, he heard about the gates of Jerusalem that was burned down and the walls that were broken down. He heard about it. And his heart was filled with anguish, saying, God, my house, my city, Jerusalem, my people are going through all of this problem. The walls are broken. The gates are burned down. It's all in ruins. And his heart was in pain. What did he do? You read, if you read the book, I'm just going to go very quick, right? Nehemiah heard this, and he sat down in sackcloth and ashes and began to fast and pray. The moment he did that, you know, he said, God, you give me an opportunity where I can speak to the king. Now, think of this. He goes to the king and the king asks him, what happened, Nehemiah? You're a cheerful man. Why is your face all dull? Why are you feeling this way? No, because the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down. The gates have been burned down. That's my city. And so I'm burdened about it. And now this king is saying, Tell me, what do you need? He says, I need people. I need money. I need your papers. I need your signatures so that I can go back and build the walls and the gate. Now, this doesn't make sense. They are the ones who destroyed it. So Nehemiah is saying, I want to go rebuild it back, and you are going to pay for the bill. What I'm going to do, you have to pay the bill. That's what really happens. And then later on, we see what is Nehemiah's work? Cup bearer. Did he do any training in leadership? Did he do any training in how to uh, lead people or how to build a wall? Was he an engineer? Nothing. But God gave him the Holy Spirit where he was able to raise up people. And in 52 days, 
He rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and the gates. 52 days. How did he do it? He had no training. He had no, he no, had no understanding on how to manage people. But he did it through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. What did he do? Okay. This is the wall. It goes all the way around. Right? So he says, okay. There are some people in the north gate. So those who live in the north gate, you go and you do the work in the morning. There are some people at West Gate. So you go, those who are living close by, you go and do the work in the evening. So he separated the works. He planned out how the work should be done. What kind of work to be done. Now these are, you know, probably some of them are farmers. Some of them, they don't have any kind of training. But here Nehemiah is saying the Holy Spirit came on them. And they were able to build this wall in 52 days. If you read the book of Nehemiah, when they started off, they said, you know, the, there was oppositions, right? They said, how can they build this wall? They, they have no training. They don't know anything. They, it's not going to be successful. They ridiculed and mocked them. Sennacherib and the, 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 the uh, people within Babylon, they mocked the Jews. They said, how can you build this wall? You're not capable enough. You're not equipped enough. You cannot build it. But by the Holy Spirit, God used normal, simple people and a leader like Nehemiah to build the walls of Jerusalem. So important. So important for us to depend on the Holy Spirit. He is the one who can give us the wisdom to solve problems. He is the one who can give us the wisdom to do the impossible when people say it's impossible. He'll make it possible. People said it's impossible, Nehemiah, you cannot do this. But he did it. The Bible says that all through in the book of Nehemiah, it's beautiful. It says, but the Lord was with them. There was oppositions. There were threats, but the Lord was with them. They came to kill Nehemiah, but the Lord was with Nehemiah. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit so powerfully in the Old Testament. Then we look at the life of Job. All of us know the story of Job. Yes, can we open up the book of Job? Chapter 26. Now Job was a contemporary of Isaiah, right? So Job 26 and verse 13. So let's by, read that by his spirit he adorned the heavens his hand pierced the fleeing serpent okay i'll read that again 26 13 by his breath the skies became fair his hand pierced the gliding gliding serpent and these are but the outer fringe of his works how faint the whisper we hear of him who then can understand the thunder of his power? Let's read Job 33 and verse 4. Job 33, verse 4. Go ahead. The Spirit of God has made me, and the bread of the Almighty has given me life. Here again, Job is reflecting and he's saying it is the Spirit of God that has made me and it is his breath that has given me life. Now, we know the story of Job. In the morning, he had, everything was good. He was blessed abundantly. He had many children. He had livestock. He was a rich man. By the evening, he had nothing with him. Nothing. Morning, he had everything. By the evening, he had nothing. And if you read the story of, of Job, it is an intriguing story of understanding the works of God, the work of the Holy Spirit in, a, in the life of a believer. His own wife tells him, why don't you curse God and die? What does he say? He says, hey, how can you say such a thing? Can we only take good things from God? He says, I know my Redeemer lives. 
I know that I will stand with him. His friends come and begin to say, you know, you did, maybe you did this wrong. You did all these mistakes. You're living a sinful life. That is why this has come upon you. Then another friend comes and says, maybe your children lived a sinful life. This is what they did. And that's why you are reaping what they are, they are sowing. And Job is all quiet. He's not giving any rebuttal. He's just quiet. He's just looking to God and saying, God, I know that Holy Spirit, you are with me. So in this challenge, I'm not going to say anything. So the entire book of Job, he goes on, but only at verse, I think it's verse 38, where God begins to speak. And he says, Job, the breath that you have is from me. I am the one who will restore you. I am the one who created the heavens and the earth. Everything, were you there when I stretched out the heavens? Were you there when I created the stars and the glory that, is, that you see above you? Were you there? Were you there when I created the mountains and the valleys and the great seas? Were you there? Job says no. But Job knew that the work of God, the Holy Spirit, was with him. He knew that in that burden, in that pain, in that suffering, when he put on sackcloth and ashes, he's got all boils and blisters on his body, full of pain. He knew, he says, I know my Redeemer lives. I know that Jesus, I know that the Holy Spirit is with me. God is with me. I may not see it. I may not feel him, but he is with me. How many of you have felt this way? Right? Where we feel, God, where are you? What is happening? Everything seems so lost. Can we be like Job and say, God, I know the Holy Spirit is with me. Now, Job, you know, the Holy Spirit came, ministered to him and went. But for you and me, the Holy Spirit is with us. He's there in us. So we can, you know, always tap into his presence, into his power. Then we look at Psalms. Now, a lot of the Psalms are written by the leading of the Holy Spirit. All the Psalms, almost every Psalm that we see um, has been written by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let's just go, go to Psalms 92. I love this Psalm. Psalm 92 and verse 10. Yes, can someone read that please? Psalms 92 and verse 10. But but you have exalted my horns like that of the wild ox. You poured over me fresh oil. Mm. Now, uh, the horn refers to leadership, right? Uh, if you see a prophetic imagery, horn refers to leadership and oil refers to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? Let's read Psalms 139 as well. This is another beautiful psalm, Psalm 139 and verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit, and where can I flee from your presence? And then we see a lot of psalms where, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, the psalmists are writing, many of them are uh, psalms about the crucifixion of Jesus. Right? We have many psalms talking about uh, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. Many psalms talking about uh, the nation of Israel, talking about God's grace, God's love. So all of this have been written by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now let's go into, let's see the life of Isaiah. Uh, let's just go a little quick so that we can finish, uh, try and complete as much as we can. Isaiah... Now, Isaiah was a great prophet, right? And, and during the reign of Uzziah, Isaiah warned of two things. Sexual immoral, immorality, wrongdoings, that is even idol worship. And then there was false worship. And Isaiah is living in a, in a different country. He's again in Babylon and there is, there is so much of you know, sin that is happening around him. And here, Isaiah, we see that he was led in many places by the Holy Spirit to write prophetically. I think Isaiah is one of the most prophetic book in the entire Bible. Right? 
So let me just pick up a few scriptures here. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 17. Sorry, Isaiah 10 and verse 27. And it will happen in that day that his burden will be taken from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. Yeah. So he's again talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let's read Isaiah 61. Now, this is a very common, common passage in Isaiah. 61, 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the meek. He has yes. sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound yes right so yeah that that should do uh anthony thank you so we see here that again isaiah is writing he's saying the spirit of the sovereign lord is upon me now there are many places isaiah 60 he says arise and shine for the glory of the lord has come upon you uh, you see isaiah 35 he's saying but the ransom of the lord shall rise up they will return to zion singing then there are many scriptures where he says uh, he's he's speaking prophetically. He's talking about um, you know just uh, when we are weary, the strength of the Lord upon you. Though the eagles, you know, though the uh, uh, though we fall, we will not be cast down. He will rise us up on wings like eagles. He will lift us up and restore us back. So all of these uh, prophetic prophetic illustrations of what God was going to do to the nation of Israel. And now all of those are applicable to us even now. Meaning what? Now when I'm discouraged or if I'm feeling weary, I go to Isaiah chapter 40 and I'll go ahead and I'll read Isaiah 40. Just because I, Isaiah is writing it for the people at that time doesn't mean they are not applicable to me now. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, when he speaks to people, and he's written this through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it is still valid for you and me now. Right? So I go to Isaiah and I'll say, verse 29, he gives, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those whose hope is in the Lord shall renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Is it applicable to us now? Very much. Then I go to Isaiah 43, verse 2 onwards. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now, is it applicable to us now? Right? So the same way God spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, He does speak to us even now. And so we can go back to the Word and say, God, speak to me. Minister to me. Right? Then we look at the life of Jeremiah. Now, I'll just go a little quick, right? Jeremiah is the prophet who was there before, during, and after the fall. You'll learn more in Old Testament survey, right? And Jeremiah, everything that he did was led by the Spirit of God. I tell you, if you read the book of Jeremiah, it's very difficult. If you had met Jeremiah at that time, you say, well, see, this guy has gone mad. You know why? God tells him, sleep on your left side for, I think it's about three, I, I, I'm not sure how many days, I think it's 300 odd days. Sleep on your left side for 300 days. Why? This is to signify that the north side, the north of Israel is going to, you know, is going to be in, in trouble. It's going to go through uh, wars and difficulties. 
It's going to be captivated. Then God tells him, okay, sleep on your, now you sleep on your right side. That's how many days? Again, a certain number of days. So for this many days, the south part of Israel is going to be in captivity. Then one day God told him, make a big hole in your house. Imagine you go to Jeremiah's house at that time, there's a big hole in the wall. People ask you, why is that hole there? Then he has to say, just like how there's a hole in the wall, the same way you people have made a hole in your hearts. Whatever God is prophesying, whatever the Lord is speaking, nothing is going into your heart. You're just listening, but you're not making any sense of it. So if you read, no, he's called the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. But it was all by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel was deported to Babylon where he preached. And there he's standing there. He's seeing the valley of dry bones. He's seeing all kinds of things. He's, God is, you know, the first chapter itself, he's seeing heaven. The Holy Spirit has opened his eyes and he's seeing the things in heaven. I see an ox. I see a face of an eagle and the calf and the man who uh, 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 the face of a man. And I see cherubims and seraphims. I see angels and two of them. Uh, you know, the angels cover their face. Some of them cover their legs and they with another set of wings. They are flying and they are seeing the glory of God. And Elijah again, after seeing all of this great vision, he had a new understanding of who God is. And what God can do. God used Elijah very powerfully among the Babylonians. Right? Then we look at the life of Daniel. We all know the story of Daniel. What did Daniel do? Fought with the lions? Or slept with the lions? <laughs> what, 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 what did Daniel do? You know... Sometimes we, we just know these names. We just understand a few things about them. But you really need to go in deep to understand the work of God in these men and women of God. Daniel was taken as a young boy, about 17 years old, into Babylon. Daniel surpassed three kings. One, two, three. They thought they can change Daniel, but Daniel changed them. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Let's, let's go, to, go to Daniel chapter 2. Think of this. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Okay? He, he doesn't know what the dream is. So he calls everyone. He says, tell me what the dream is. First, you have to tell me what my dream is and then explain the dream. Now look at Daniel chapter 2. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has told him, this is what, uh, you know, those who interpret, who tell me my dream and interpret, interpret my dream, they are the ones who will be honored. Now, Daniel chapter 2 onwards, 2 verse 20 onwards, he says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes, de deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God, my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we, have, we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Now, this is after Daniel is praying and the Holy Spirit has revealed what the dream is. If you go on from chapter 24 onwards, Daniel goes to the king and begins to explain that dream. How did he do it? Through the anointing and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Many years later, King Nebuchadnezzar's son, Balthazar, He's drinking happily. He says, go and bring the cup that we got from Jerusalem, the cup which was used to do the offerings in the temple. Go and bring that. I want to drink from that cup. So they go and bring it. And as he's drinking, one hand comes and writes on the wall. 
मैंने मैंने टेके लो फासन ना द किंग इज इन शॉक ओनली अ हैंड नो पर्सन ओनली वन हैंड इज रिटर्न दे कॉल्ड अप डैनियल डैनियल प्लीज कम we need you here daniel comes and says see i'm going to interpret this dream for you i'm going to interpret what has happened here right how did he do it he was led by the holy spirit the holy spirit spoke to him and told him this word okay king this is what it is number 1 it says mene mene tekel fasin that means god has measured you and found you useless that means you are a useless king so god is going to destroy your kingdom and now your kingdom will be divided into two today is that that is going to happen today oh please pray to god that this does not happen no i cannot change it you have done something which is evil in the eyes of god today your kingdom will be divided into two now here's an important lesson under the anointing of the holy spirit now daniel didn't say let me change it what if my life, what if he gets angry with me and throws me into prison by the time daniel is old now it didn't change he knew the, that the holy spirit is greater than what they are doing so I, if the holy spirit has given me the word i must obey it and he did it the kingdom was divided the persians and the medes the next king comes darius comes they try to trap daniel right you are you are worshiping other gods where what to do throw him in the lions den nothing changed daniel you see let me go to daniel chapter 6 see when you read the bible no we must understand certain things it's very powerful right because if we just read it like as if it's a work to do we may not understand some of the things now daniel knows that there's an edict that has he only put the stamp so he is the leader right he put the stamp what is the stamp those who worship other gods will be thrown into the lions den he is the one who put the stamp and said okay do what you have to do now read this verse chapter 6 and verse 10 now when daniel learnt of the decree that had been published he went home up went to his home upstairs room where the window was open towards jerusalem three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his god just as he had done before in some translations it says as usual everyone say as usual monday to friday bible college will happen as usual next week monday to friday bible college will happen sunday morning you all go to church will anything change the same way daniel knew oh if i if i open this window and i pray to god and then cctv camera is seeing this then i'll be thrown into the lions den that's the last day of my life did he do five days fasting prayer was he crying and saying god why this is happening to me was he crying nothing he went he opened the window as he prayed as usual nothing changed you want to throw me in the lions den leopards den put me in jail you want to cut my head off you do what you want as usual i will do what i have to do now from where did he get that by the anointing of the holy spirit it it cannot be by his own strength now he went into the lions den what was he doing nothing he went slept and got back up nothing changed see when you go against people who are anointed of god the enemy has no place what does the verse after that say the king said go and throw the soldiers in before they reached the ground they were dead they were killed the lions pounced on them right when the holy spirit is working especially we see it in the old testament and even now when he's working he is able to protect us he is able to lead us to the path that he wants us to be right now 
let's look at Joel. Joel, Micah, Haggai, Zechariah. These four are uh, minor prophets, but we'll not go into all of them. Let's go into Haggai chapter 2, verse 5, quickly. We've got another five minutes. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 5. Let's read that. Yeah. <clears throat> According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remained among you. Fear not. Hmm. According to the word that I have covenanted with you, my spirit will remain with you, so you fear not. Now, listen. In Haggai chapter 1, God calls Haggai to tell the king, okay, you're going to build a house for the Lord. You're going to build a temple for God, right? And that's when God is, is promising. He's saying, when, the, when you build this temple, the glory of the Lord will be upon this house. I have covenanted with you. My spirit will be with you. Just as how my spirit was with Moses and the people who built the temple at that time, just as how my spirit was with David and Solomon and all these prophets, my spirit is with you. So you will build this temple and my glory will come upon you. That's what happens in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 4, 6, and we'll close with this and take a break. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Now, let me give you a background before you read that. Zechariah is the prophet there, and now they're ready to build the temple. There's a king named Zerubbabel, right? Zerubbabel is saying, okay, what is the point of me building this temple, God? If I, as a king, if I build this temple, even while I'm building it, the, the enemies will come and destroy this temple. I can't go against these enemies. And how will I build this temple? I don't have the resources. I don't have the people. I, 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 I'm lost. I cannot build this temple. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. Zechariah 4.6. Read. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, by my might, not by power, not by my spirit, see the Lord of hosts. So now, Zerubbabel is thinking to himself, how will I build this temple? I can't build a temple. They will destroy this temple and they will, you know, they, they may kill us also. How can you, how can I think of this? I don't have the resources. I don't have the funds. I don't have the people. It's impossible to build this. Then God sends Zechariah. Listen, Zechariah, Zechariah is going and saying, Zerubbabel, listen, you're the king, right? It is not by your own might. It is not by your own strength. But it is by the spirit of the Lord that you will build this temple. So look at your strength. You're the king of Israel. You're the king of this nation. But you will not do it on your own strength. You may have an army with you. They are not going to use that strength. But it is by the spirit of the Lord. That means what? The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, will come upon your people. I will give you the wisdom. I will give you the grace. I will give you the strength on how to build this temple, when to build the temple, what you must do, what you must not do. Everything, it is by the Spirit of the Lord. Just as I was with Moses. Just as they, rebuilt, they, they walked with the Ark of the Covenant wherever they went. And the tabernacle was with them. The same way, Zerubbabel, by the Spirit of God, you will rebuild this temple. And it happens so. It happens so. So what is this learning that we see? The Holy Spirit is the same. He hasn't changed his ways. All through the Old Testament when we see, right? He hasn't changed his ways. And you and I as believers... We're going to look at chapter 4, uh, you know, in, in the life of Jesus, how the Holy Spirit worked. And the Holy Spirit will continue to work in each of our lives. Can he work what he did in the Old Testament? Yes. Can he change the way he worked in the Old Testament and work differently now? Can he work differently now? Yes. 
No, meaning well, how he did in the Old Testament, will he do the exact same thing now? Or he, can he change it? He can change it. Right? That's how he is. He can the the he can change the way he does things, but he the person of the Holy Spirit does not change. Amen. Right? So we'll take a break, we'll come back and go to chapter four.